Good morning. A very warm welcome to the IIE webinar on cybersecurity and EU strategic autonomy, coherence and capability challenges. This event is part of a transnational project with think tanks in the Netherlands, Denmark, <coughs> Estonia and Sweden, which is coordinated by the IIEA and supported by Google. My name is Joyce O'Connor, Chair of the IIEA Digital Group and moderator of today's event. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back to the IIEA our distinguished speaker, Professor Kieran Martin. You're very welcome, Kieran. I'm really pleased to see you again and thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. And we appreciate this very much indeed. And we look forward to your presentation. Kieran produced an excellent paper for the IIEA Cybersecurity and European Strategic Autonomy, which is available on our website. Uh, he produced this in May this year. So in today's event, he'll present the key points from this paper, as well as talking about some recent developments since May in EU cybersecurity. He will conclude by talking about the choice facing Europe caught between two technospheres, uh, the US and China, and Europe's own ambition to become a global digital power. Kiran will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and then I will go to you, our audience, for Q&A. And as you know, the Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send in questions during Kiran's presentation as they occur, occur to you, and I'll come back to you once Kiran finishes his talk. As ever, today's presentation and Q&A is on the record. Please join our discussion if you want to on Twitter. The handle is at IIEA. Professor Kieran Martin is currently Professor of Practice in Management of Public Organization at the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford University. Prior to joining the School of Government and Ox Oxford University, Kieran was founding chief executive of the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, part of GCHQ. Professor Martin led a fundamental shift in the UK's approach to cybersecurity. He successfully advocated for a wholesale change of approach to cybersecurity towards a more interventionist posture. This approach was adopted by the UK government in the 2015 National Security Strategy, leading to the creation of the National Cyber Security Centre in 2016 under his leadership. In his 23 years career in the UK civil service, Professor Martin has held senior roles in the cabinet office, including constitution director and director of security and intelligence in the, uh, in the cabinet office. His work has been recognized nationally and internationally, receiving awards and honors in the UK, the US and elsewhere. Kieran's knowledge of public finances national and international security and central bureaucracy is a rare combination of expertise and experience. So Kieran, you have the floor now and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Joyce. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining me. Thanks to the IIEA for having me. I learned in my previous job in the UK government never to underestimate the IIEA. I recall a wonderful morning in Dublin in around 2018, where um, a small number of opinion formers had been gathered for a private roundtable on cybersecurity. And then afterwards, I'd agreed that there would be a small uh, event where I would do uh, some public remarks <clears throat> on the record because, and, and of course, I was a serving senior member of the uh, UK government at the time. So when the door opened uh, to this small gathering, which turned out to be 150 of uh, some of the most influential people in Irish technology and other aspects of, of, of uh, national life, I uh, somewhat uh, shuddered and, and did a double take. I know there are many eminent uh, people and a large number of people uh, listening in, but this time, hopefully, I have uh, I've learned my lesson about the IIA's con convening power on important subjects. Um, so I was privileged to answer their request um, uh, back in what, what became a publication in May uh, for a contribution to a series of studies they were looking at on the EU and technology. And they asked me to write something on cybersecurity and European strategic autonomy. 
and I chose to focus on two issues. One is the coherence of the EU's approach to cyber, and the other is the influence between that and capabilities. And I drew two quite different uh, contestable, just my opinion, you may not share it, and we, that can come out in questions, um, but I hope uh, reasonably significant uh, conclusions. One is around the coherence of the EU's efforts on cyber security uh, in the midst of a bunch of harms that can happen uh, as a result of malevolent cyber activity uh, from hostile powers, criminals, and a range of other uh, people. And the conclusion of coherence is that um, there is a technocratic question for the EU and its member states about at what level does it want to do cyber security? What does it want to leave to member states and what does it want to, in effect, federalize? Uh, that is a a fixable technocratic challenge, but it needs answering because otherwise, if you do it unconsciously, it leads to, in my view, suboptimal uh, outcomes. And I'll say a little bit about how that choice manifests, what sort of harms it's trying to counter. But additionally, um, where it has somewhat stumbled into uh, so far into quite a messy uh, alignment between uh, allocation of responsibilities between member states and uh, central uh, uh, EU-wide authorities. So that's the coherence point. How do you configure, if you like, the capabilities, 27 member states and a unifying central set of institutions uh, to do cyber uh, security? And what does that tell you about the EU strategic autonomy? Then you get into the much more important question, a much more difficult question, in my view, which is about capabilities. And in essence, the quite provocative question I propose is what form of autonomy ultimately can Europe have when you're basically using other people's technology? Mm. There is some indigenous technology in Europe, in the European Union, in the UK, in the continent of Europe. But we are, as Joyce said, uh, now sandwiched increasingly between two technospheres, a US-led bloc and a Chinese bloc. And as recently as Friday evening, I was talking to a former digital minister of a smaller EU member state who was talking about the EU's ambition to be a global leader in the regulation of AI. My simple rhetorical challenge is how far can you be a leader in anything by being a leader in its regulation, but not in its development? And what are the implications of that for Europe. So I'll take those two in turn with some reflections on each and trying to weave in where I can significant events since May, whether they do or don't uh, promote the general thesis I'm implying, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, advocating. So first, let's go to coherence. Um, if uh, as if you were in my position in the period sort of 2014 to 2020, when I set up and led the UK's National uh, Cybersecurity uh, Centre, it was a somewhat odd position from which to watch developments in EU cybersecurity, given the UK's uh, initially full participation, then half membership in the departure lounge, uh, and eventual departure at the beginning of uh, 2020. But that um, in some respects, give me quite a valuable um, uh, perspective on the way that the EU was developing on it. And one thing I would say around um, uh, cybersecurity uh, influence globally is that uh, national capabilities give you a ticket and not having those national capabilities don't. So if you like, um, in operational cybersecurity between governments, uh, Europe, the most important uh, mechanisms in Europe are largely private. They're not talked about much. They're largely voluntary and they're largely voluntarily multilateral. There are all sorts of little groups of institutional cooperation between the UK and CSC, the French, the Irish authorities and so forth, little mini groups and so forth. And very often, and I'll come to this in a little part, they're not highly dependent on the treaties of the European Union uh, because they're national security organizations and therefore uh, um, exempt. And as you might expect, in terms of national cybersecurity capabilities, uh, three of the most uh, powerful in this continent are Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. And so I start by this rather glorious incident in 2017 at the Estonian Digital Summit in Tallinn. Estonia, as you may remember, had an extended presidency because the UK post-referendum uh, gave, gave up uh, the, the, the six months. 
And um, we'd had a very interesting discussion between me and my French and German uh, counterparts uh, around trilateral security cooperation between the three big uh, powers. Then, of course, and I knew full, full well this would happen, you know, I was not allowed on stage with them because of the UK's position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the European yeah. Union at the time. So I happily embraced the role of bad smell at the conference, at least in public. And uh, the French and German, my French and German counterparts went on stage together. And what followed was extraordinary. I had been talking privately with my German counterpart, Arne Schoenbaum, the head of an organization called the BSI, who was scathing about the EU's latest uh, national mandates for its member states on cybersecurity. Because essentially, in the words of, a, uh, uh, a, a, of an academic from the University of Louvain, Germany was being required uh, by Alexandre uh, uh, Samajenk uh, is the name of the academic, Germany was being required to replace a more advanced cybersecurity strategy with a less advanced one if it took the Commission's regulations uh, uh, seriously. The Commission's ambition was to level up, to use a British politics phrase, uh, national cyber capabilities but in doing so was actually constraining what Germany, which had been doing this uh, to a high degree of capability for years, uh, was being was being asked to do. And I sort of said, you're not going to say any of this on stage, are you? And he said all of it on stage and actually led a denunciation of, if you like, the Europeanization of cybersecurity at the expense of some of the more capable um, uh, member uh, 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 member states, and this I think is a really interesting um, illustration of the problem. Now, if you've dealt with cybersecurity as I have for many years, and you look from a nation state uh, perspective at the sort of threats, what you have ranges from profound matters of national security, often if not covert reasonably uh, classified, um, requiring high-end national security capabilities, some of which will be uh, secret, often in an intelligence or Department of Defense type of context, all the way through to criminals hacking uh, bits of data off commercial companies in a very obvious and open, uh, an, an open way. And therein lies the challenge of doing cybersecurity at EU level. Because part of this, and nations like France feel extremely strongly about this, as perhaps surprisingly to some of you do, uh, Germany, as shown by the Tallinn uh, anecdote, um, they engage profound matters of national sovereignty, which they will be very reluctant to give away, very reluctant to share. Um, on the other hand, the other end, data breaches, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Europe has been a world leader in data regulation for good or ill with the general data protection uh, regulation of uh, 2018, all the way through to matters of digital trade, which lend themselves very obviously to um, uh, leadership at, 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 at EU level. So if you're worried about Russian state espionage and national parliaments, which is a, has been a consistent problem across all areas of the European Union for many years. Uh, most countries will default to doing that at nation state uh, level. If you're worried about um, an apparent uh, French, uh, apparent attack on, by Russia on a French TV station in 2015, the instinct will be to deal with that at member state level. And indeed in that specific example, France takes a very different approach to the issue of attribution, the public accusing of a hostile power of malevolent cyber activity. France doesn't do it, the UK does, the Baltics do, the Scandinavians do. So there's significant, if you like, tensions and differences of approach between them, but they'll want this, the national freedom, the autonomy to do that themselves. On the other hand, in the digital single market, how can you regulate against data breaches? How can you put together uh, different uh, 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 approaches? You'll want something uh, uh, um, uh, unified. Now, there have been some significant developments at EU-wide level, something called the NIS Directive, and there are now two of them, Network Information Systems, has some harmonized approaches for the regulation of critical national infrastructure uh, across, um, uh, across the uh, 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 Union. Um, increasingly, um, and there's something called DORA, the Digital Operational Resilience Act, uh, has harmonized um, uh, expectations for cyber resilience amongst big financial uh, uh, in, in, in institutions. But again, to go back to the German criticism of this, um, 
this cannot be what cannot be ignored is the variance in national capabilities. Now, one of the difficulties in cybersecurity is actually assessing how good people's capabilities are. And there are various organizations that try to do league tables of international capability in cybersecurity, and they're all wildly different. But the International Telecommunications Union is one of the more respected and authoritative uh, lists. And what's interesting is that of the um, top 20 ranked countries in the world and the most recent index in 2027 are in the EU, Estonia, Spain, Lithuania, France, Luxembourg, Germany, and Portugal. But um, nine are outside the top 40 and a further six are outside the top 50. And it tends to be the further north you go, uh, the more capable it becomes, sadly, I'm afraid to say the exception in the last ranking is Ireland, which uh, which placed um, uh, 54th, although the government since the HSE hack has, um, uh, has put in place significant investment and reforms, and we'll see how, how that goes. So what you have is, if you like, a central uh, the central European functions increasingly putting in place EU-wide regulations on this, but in very, very different national contexts about the capabilities um, uh, needed to make them uh, uh, a reality. So in other words, one of the risks is that they're not sophisticated enough for Germany, which is frankly incentivized, as its head said in 2018, to do its own thing. And perhaps they're too challenging for some of those lower down the scale. And maybe they're aimed at those and bring them up to a basic uh, minimum standard. But essentially, the discussion that I think um, that one of the two discussions that you will need to have more strategically is which parts of this do you genuinely believe are best left to national authorities? Because there is an element of this, just as there is in defence, where countries will be more and more incent will, will be incentivized uh, to um, do at least some of their own thing. There are parts of this that are very obviously around the digital market where it'll lend itself to uh, EU-wide uh, regulations. But how do you then make sure that you're not penalizing those who've got ahead, built good digital defenses, good ecosystems for digital defenses, uh, and so forth? And the second challenge is what you do at EU-wide uh, level. There are bodies, uh, INISA, the uh, Athens-based um, uh, cybersecurity uh, agency, which sets sort of regulatory standards. Uh, um, there is something called a CERT, Computer Emergency Response Team, which is increasingly under international practice, a required function for every nation state to have, and the EU uh, has one. There's an intelligence center um, set up by the External uh, Action uh, Service, but relative, for example, to a France, to a Germany, to a UK, they're very small organizations in terms of personnel uh, and, and, and expertise. So what is, um, if you like, the balance between eyes and stomach of the EU in terms of its capabilities and how does that relate to member states. Now, so far, I'm actually going to, because that sort of brings me to the end of the first question on coherence, if you like, um, and if you like, national uh, capabilities. And so far, you know, apologies if you find it rather boring. And um, the reason I say that is that everything I've said so far is, I think, makes for an interesting technocratic discussion about some fixable problems. I don't think there's anything than what I've said that is an extremely sort of cumbersome, intellectually difficult, long-term policy challenge. It's a bunch of choices and then investment and reforms and institutions and practices arising from those uh, choices. But there's nothing that complicated about deciding on the right balance and the, Europe, and the, the EU uh, institutions and culture have been used to doing this in all the topics for decades now about finding the right way of configuring a bunch of capabilities, regulations, and relationships about how to do this. And you can take your own view as to how that should be done. But I'll turn now to capabilities of a different sort. And by this, I mean, in a sense, the building and operating of technology. And this is where I think Europe has got a, um, has got a much more fundamental problem. And by this, I will probably lazily and unintentionally um, interchange the European continent, including, for example, the UK, and Switzerland and, and others and the European Union, because frankly, I think whilst the solutions may be different because of the EU's ability to act at 27 and other countries uh, not having that um, ability, but the problem is actually the same. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental problem is that the tech revolution has been driven by people not, and institutions and companies that aren't here, that are not in this continent, whether uh, in the EU or out of it. 
So the top 20 tech companies by market cap in 2020, 10 were American, five were Chinese, and the remaining three were Japanese, Korean, or Taiwanese. That is should no surprise to anybody. Uh, the um, major part of the um, technological market by my reckoning where Europe plays a significant role is the highly faltering telecoms infrastructure market where the two Scandinavian giants of Nokia and Ericsson are globally strategically important companies that register in the White House, register in Beijing, uh, their fate for good or ill matters. Uh, we saw that with the 5G controversy, um, the mismanagement globally of the telecoms infrastructure market over recent years has been really, really striking. Um, and these companies are there, but they are the exception. In the paper, for example, I've um, given uh, uh, a, a separate analysis of um, uh, national security requirements in the UK and France and how they relate to data hosted in the US. So essentially, for purposes um, principally, but not confined to counterterrorism, uh, the ability to analyze data on suspicious activity is hugely constrained by US law. And ultimately, because of the headquarter location of a lot of these uh, 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 companies, American law, there's special protections for US citizens, for communications transiting in and out of the US, which basically all communications do, uh, have placed great constraints on the sovereignty and strategic autonomy of other uh, countries. So I've contrasted the um, uh, contrasting fortunes of the UK and France in seeking, in effect, a negotiated arrangement for special access to data held by US companies, known as the Cloud Act. The UK has a one the French have not. That's not to say that um, there's something special about um, the UK's uh, position, although as a Five Eyes partner, it does give uh, the UK um, both access to greater uh, security data and indeed some more leverage in discussions in Washington. But the fact is you have two other permanent members of the Security Council who are both nuclear powers, in effect, having to go and beg the US Congress for access to data that they deem vital for national security. That's not strategic autonomy for either country, um, but that's the way of the world. You will think back to the outrage um, in many parts of Europe, particularly in Germany after the Snowden leaks, and lots of talk then about, in effect, trying to you know, make sure that the way Europe used the internet uh, uh, did not lend itself to uh, uh, such things in future. That talk lasted a few months before it dissipated on the grounds that the technology is not there. Uh, there is no uh, possible viable way of, um, of, 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 of doing this. Now that doesn't leave Europe powerless. Um, you know, it is half a billion uh, in the EU, it is nearly half a billion by global standards, wealthy internet users. So there is mileage in being a regulatory superpower. Uh, the, the EU has shown that in uh, data. Um, it has enacted one of the most forward-leaning uh, and indeed in my view, absolutely welcome in terms of global cybersecurity uh, set of regulations on the internet of things uh, in the world. And this is really important stuff. Uh, essentially, one of the big problems in, in cybersecurity has been um, the exploitation of intrinsically weak technology. To give you an example, there was a major attack which affected um, Twitter, Amazon, host of other household names uh, on the east coast of the US in uh, 2016. And the way it was done was hijacked a bunch, hundreds of thousands of CCTV cameras and just pointed them at what's called a DNS provider. Uh, essentially think of the phone book of the internet, took it down. So all this traffic going to Twitter and Amazon didn't know where, uh, didn't know where to go. And so essentially the services um, uh, collapsed. The way those CCTV cameras were hacked uh, was that um, they were, um, the default password on them was password. And even if you, uh, uh, noticed that um, the uh, technology, the cameras were built so you couldn't change it. Under the EU regulations, that is now illegal to sell such stuff. That's really pioneering and really good stuff. So there is agency for Europe in being a regulatory superpower, but it only, in my view, takes you so far. There are more cases where you're going in effect as per this so-called Cloud Act, where you're in effect um, a supplicant to you know the, the uh, uh, to to a US US led uh, sphere, but more importantly, I think you're beginning to detect in um, in the transatlantic uh, tech dialogue um, a potential change in US attitudes, and I'll just I'll I'll come to that in in a minute. 
We can talk a bit more in the in the Q and A about um, you know the sorts of threats we're trying to encounter. Uh, we're trying to counter, um, and there are all sorts of criminal threats. There, are, you know, uh, as everyone in Ireland knows from the health uh, um, health services executive uh, outrage last year, there's a problem with Russian organised criminality. There's uh, malevolent uh, North Korean activity against financial institutions. There's lots of Iranian spying and so forth. But the two most common threat actors we talk about are the Russian state and the Chinese uh, uh, and the Chinese state. But here I need to bring attention to an important difference between Russia and China. And I've said this many times before the war showed up some of Russia's uh, perhaps um, uh, limitations as, a, uh, as, as an aggressor, but it holds even more true uh, now. When it comes to the, our technological uh, ecosystem, uh, it is now very fashionable, but no less true for that to say that um, when it comes to our sort of digital security, Russia is severe bad weather, but China is climate change. Mm. And this matters because in a sense, what Russia does is cheats on America's internet. Okay, so it's, uh, it doesn't have anything of its own. It, um, it spies, it disrupts, it hacks into um, essentially technology built by the US and its, uh, and, and its allies. So your job there as a defender is to try to reduce the number of times they're successful and reduce the impact when they are successful. So it's conceptually easy. Operationally, it's very, very difficult to the first part of the conversation. Um, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be very difficult and it requires lots of careful organization uh, and, and so forth. But conceptually, it's quite simple. China is now completely different. It does all of that stuff that Russia does. It spies, it steals stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But it also has now built an alternative set of technologies that work differently. They lend themselves much more to state control. They have gigantic companies that can do all the data processing. They can do all the infrastructure uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And there is now, if you like, a some people use the phrase tech cold war. It's not a phrase I particularly like, but I can't think of an alternative other than these two technospheres. They're now, in effect, around the world, including, as we saw over 5G um, a con in Europe, a contest between the US-led bloc and the Chinese-led bloc for supremacy. Now, in that scenario, my judgment is that Europe will default to the US-led uh, uh, bloc. But rhetorically, and I stressed rhetorically, there is a lot of talk in Europe about why are we in this position and shouldn't we have our own strategic autonomy so we can take our own decisions? And I'm afraid the answer to that at the moment, by and large, is no, other than in some aspects of regulatory policy and a few bits of telecoms infrastructure, because the capabilities aren't there. So in a sense, one of the things I notice in the regulatory uh, discussions is a sense on the US side that, look, Whatever you, whether you like Facebook or not, and most people don't, whether you like various other uh, US uh, tech giants, um, the beast, if you like, is, uh, is not US tech. Um, faced with the choice between a US-led tech model and a Chinese-led tech model, it is obviously more closely in line with the EU's values and Europe's values as a whole um, to go with uh, the US uh, uh, model. And what choice do we have if we don't have anything of, of, of our own um, being, being built in, 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 in that? So I think that's something for um, Europe to watch in future, the limitations of being a regulatory uh, superpower, but also, frankly, the importance of thinking about what is built and run and operated from within the continent itself. And it gets very, very hard. It also, and I think the US are finding this themselves, it is, um, it is a hard set of policies and practices to get right in liberal market democracies. I mean, the Biden administration has now just passed an extraordinary piece of legislation, which includes all of the following uh, three things. One is $52 billion worth of subsidies for the US domestic microchip. Uh, industry. Uh, secondly, a bunch of sanctions on Chinese uh, companies in terms of um, mm -hmm. using US IP and so forth. Many people have likened it to a race where the US are both trying to run faster and slow the competitor down. But most extraordinarily, um, a set of possible sanctions on US companies and companies trading in the US, i.e. lots of European companies, if they do any business in China or with these Chinese uh, companies. So there you can see this bifurcation mm -hmm this bifurcation um, uh, 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 happening. 
and that that uh, act has passed since I uh, wrote uh, the, the 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 paper. So just to conclude, because I know we're coming to the end of uh, of time, I think there is a sort of technocratic um, problem or challenge, but it's fixable within Europe, which is faced with a bunch of malevolent cyber threats, which I think as the war in Ukraine has shown, are more, if you like, chronic than catastrophic. We're not talking about um, you know, digital Armageddon. We're not talking about cyber pearl harbors. We're talking about the persistent and pernicious loss of data. We're talking about more incidents like the HSE in Ireland, where you have massive and sometimes physically dangerous social and economic uh, uh, disruption. How do you frame a set of capabilities amongst an advanced digital market of half a million people with 27 national governments and a bunch of central institutions? We've got that challenge. That can be that can be solved, but the greater long-term challenge is there is a race on for mastery of the technologies of the future between the U.S. and China. There is a third block of advanced mass market digital users who don't have the indigenous infrastructure to compete there, are largely using laws and regulation to maintain a voice, and changing that in terms of planning organizing markets, cooperating across um, uh, national barriers, balancing economics and security, balancing the short and the long term is a profoundly difficult challenge. But any meaningful discussion of European strategic autonomy in cyberspace has to grasp it. It's not something that can be solved by strategy documents. It's something that requires profound discussions about national sovereignty, about European integration, but also, frankly, um, how Europe interacts as a block with the rest of the world. So I'll stop there, Joyce. I hope that's given you some food for thought and very keen to move to the Q&A. Thanks very much, Kieran. It definitely has given us food for thought and maybe a warning shot across our bows. And it certainly wasn't boring at all. Uh, I, I must say you've raised many issues and challenges, but very clearly set the scene, if you like, of what, what the challenges are. And, you know, I'm very pleased to see that you're optimistic that we can look at particularly the challenge of... Um, working together on the more chronic issues, but the future issue really is the race on mastery of the future of technologies and how that's going to place out. So thank you very much for that. And we might start with the first question, because you've said that the EU must make a choice either to seriously commit to a technological industrial policy to achieve a strategic autonomy or else pursue closer cooperation with the US. So what happens if the EU fails to make a choice between these possibilities for the divergences between member states? And what possibility uh, is likely to occur by default? So I think, um, I mean, just my view, and it's a prediction, therefore caveat supply. Um, I think uh, not taking a choice defaults over time into closer dependence on the US. I think we've seen that over um, uh, various uh, issues in the past. And I can't see certainly with um, geopolitics the way they are, uh, too many people trying to uh, do what we did maybe 10 years ago and balance the US and China against each other. And then I think the second order effect of that is over time, probably not through any specific incident, landmark incident, but over time, the EU's regulatory power diminishes on the grounds that, you know, eventually the US strategically says, well, what actually are you going to do instead? You know, if we don't like the uh, burdens that uh, you're putting on essentially US technology and US companies, then what are you going to do about it? Um, so that would be my, uh, that would be, be, be my prediction on, 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 on that front. Yes. And, you know, currently, the, you know, you've mentioned it about the EU, US Trade and Technology Council. How yeah. do you think, and that it is more optimistic, and there seems to be more kind of effort to get things going, but it is, is it still at that superficial level? Have those profound discussions taken place? Not my knowledge. So um, I think um, there are, um, there are two sets of, um, 
nascent dialogues going on in the world um, around. So if you take, for example, if you go back to the G7 declaration in 2021 on Cornwall, it's actually a really, really interesting uh, declaration signed by the leaders, including uh, EU leaders who were there, uh, around recognising the fact that, as I said in the presentation, for the first time there is a there is a competent competitor to the US-led tech model, and there's no such thing as sort of borderless technology anymore, essentially what it says. Mm. And that if you want to protect free and open, classically liberal technology, you have to basically work harder and coordinate it better. So there are two sets of activities um, going on through that. One is, if you like, an informal G7. There was talk of something called a D10, in other words, the G7 plus um, India, Singapore, and uh, uh, Korea, South Korea, I think, you know, talking about this. The problem is they don't have the infrastructure to move markets. You know, what happens after this? You go back to your national capital and you do what exactly, uh, given that you're talking about the organization of technological markets? So they um so they they are sort of more nimble than if you like a US EU uh, uh, structure, but they don't have the infrastructure to do anything. Uh, the EU and the US have got the exact opposite problem. Uh, you know they have the infrastructure and the ability to talk to each other. They have close on a mm-hmm. billion citizens between them, uh, of some of the richest uh, and technologically advanced people in the world. Uh, but the mechanisms are incredibly cumbersome, and the trade offs are massive. You know we all know. I mean. These are sort of, you know, turbocharged version of trade talks. We all know how difficult those can be, the sectoral interests that they engage, et et cetera, et cetera. And even within the EU, I mean, if you look at one of the, um, you know, both the EU and US, the reason we're in such a mess on telecoms is the way that um, I think free markets find it hard to regulate for long term security and and Mm -hmm. sort of strategic stability. So 20 years ago, the EU was the world leader in uh, essentially in commercial telecommunications. You know, all the big sort of you know telco providers, so many of them were in Europe. Europe was consolidating. Uh, the way regulation has been done through nobody's fault, it was it was well intended. But the way regulation has been done in the past twenty years has contributed to breaking that model, because the whole point has been about uh, within the EU. It's been about um, make sure that it's lowest possible consumer prices and no roaming charges between member states. It's essentially been the bedrock of European telco uh, regulations for the last 20 years. That's left no room to build up, if you like, strategic capability to look at these in the way that China mm-hmm. does as strategic national assets that need to be nurtured. Then how do you get that that sort of dialogue, changing that within the EU itself is hard enough. Trying to do that between the EU and the US is going to be really, really hard. But that's probably the only area of, if you like, Western life where you have the institutional framework and you have the commercial power. So that is where I think the best hope lies of, uh, of doing this. But I think it involves Europe, first of all, making that choice as to what extent it it's seeking to pursue genuine strategic autonomy as opposed to regulatory autonomy, which is not the same thing. Um, uh, And um, and uh, what sort of deal does it intend to strike with the US if it becomes available? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot on because in a sense, if you look at the overall commission and the digital agenda, it is in fact kind of there to promote small and medium-sized companies and larger companies to develop that technological competence, particularly in selected areas. You mentioned the Internet of Things, you know, AI, blockchain and and other areas. Um, But why is it, in your opinion, that Europe has failed to be a world leader despite its vision, its focus, its emphasis? in producing digital technology industry in the same way as as the US and China. Now, China has it has uh, has greater capabilities in terms of the state's intervention. But why is it? Because that is a very key ambition. And is it realistic? So the honest answer, George, is I don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. I think um, so it's partly that um, scale really matters um uh i wish it weren't so but you know you saw this if you take the big data giants on the west coast of the us and product yeah. giants in apple and so forth they're there early they scale up they you know, gobble up competitors uh etc and they're very hard now to uh to, to 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 break for whatever reason it has become much harder to build scale players in european union yes. and indeed yeah. in the uk 
Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons in terms of you know the ecosystem of Silicon Valley and so forth that you've got to look, I suppose, at what gave the US its unique um, uh, unique advantage. China, of course, a lot of not all of it um, is uh, state is, is is state planning. The first phase of Chinese technological development was actually, I suppose, if you like, in the post Dung reforms, entrepreneurial phase of it. But since you know, certainly since 2015, a lot of it is now state planning and long term uh, uh, long term execution of that plan in the way that you know the EU and indeed the US would find extremely difficult, given the profoundly different systems of 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 of, of government. Um, I do think that one potential um, uh, reason, I don't think it's the only reason or possibly even the primary reason, because I'm not trying to get all sort of, you know, um, uh, free market ideologue um, on mm -hmm. you, but I do think that um, when it comes to regulation, uh, and again, it's contestable, I'm not an EU expert, but it does seem that when it comes to uh, tech, you know, the... Um, the regulatory focus is understandably, but perhaps um, uh, not always advisably, just almost exclusively focused on the consumer. Um, you know, the price, the safety aspects, and all of which are absolutely have to be part of it. But what about the long term sustainability, the scalability, if you like, of a particular, yeah. you know, uh, of, of a particular uh, product? Because if you're, you know, if if you're coming out of the EU and that's your home market and you have to pay attention to all of these things. And there's no, if you like, feature of the regulatory system that allows you just to really, really develop and scale up. And then there's somebody else in the US who can just do it and then export it to Europe um, on a much bigger scale. Uh, there, is, there, 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 is, uh, there is something in, 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 in that, I think. I think there's also something around, um, you know, whilst again, um, there are all sorts of aspects of the US ecosystem that are very much um, just originate entirely in the private sector. You know, there's this massive amount of um, both um, uh, spin-off research from, you know, the, the behemoth that, it, that, well, also the US, the Pentagon and so forth yeah, uh, and, and, and all yeah. that. Uh, and also, frankly, you know, very, very large scale research programs funded by the US government uh, on a scale yeah. that, you know, um, Europe, because it does at a member state level, will never, will never match. So again, you know, at EU level, what sort of huge research programs might you think about and how and again what's the deal there between uh the central eu mechanisms as a whole and member states about where the fruits of that um, of that research go uh, yeah. et etc et etc i think there are there are, scale really really matters in this business yeah. and it's it's proved harder to scale in europe and a scale matters not only in that development of it but also in the support systems, as you say, like the universities, the investment Absolutely. in research and all yeah. of that area, which, you know, that just hasn't had that quantum investment like in the US. Yeah. But just staying on, on this issue about investing seriously in techno-industrial policy, Seamus Allen from the IIEA asked the question, if Euro, Europe did choose to invest, and in a way I'm wondering, are you saying, you know how can we but you can answer that in a te in a techno uh, industry policy to significantly develop its digital sovereignty what steps should europe take to ensure it is successful or to compete with the us and china um so i think um i think there are a number of things one is the um one is a serious sort of research strategy and and, and capability around that. Um, the second, uh, and also you know picking the right technologies and and, and so on to yeah. to research and invest. And a second part of that is then, you know, and this 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 risk sounding a little bit protectionist, although I think it is actually commensurate with what's happening in the US and the UK, is actually then thinking about the sort of uh, rules and. Uh, procedures flow from that in terms of what you're allowed to do with that research you know keeping it in uh, in 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 europe and so forth a third as i've already mentioned is making sure that the regulation of the use of these technologies is mindful to the long term that you're not just squeezing costs yeah. down as low as possible to consumers um because that means that you know they will be out invested by uh, american um uh, 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 uh competitors um 
um, a fourth and very difficult um, uh, challenge for you know a, a, a multinational um, uh, or a supranational, if you like, union is um, you know having some uh, honest discussions about location. I mean, you know, we talk about the virtual world, but actually, this takes up a huge amount of physical resources and needs physical presence for large scale manufacturing of, of various things. Well. You know where in the EU might that be, um, and that's obviously a very difficult uh, decision. It's a difficult decision even within a nation state. Never mind a multinational um, uh, uh, union. So there are all um, there 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 are a whole bunch of things. I think that um, um, you know to be optimistic because you, you did say in your question, Joyce. You know, um, uh, is it even possible? I think it is possible. Uh, it's not quick. It's not quick. I mean, look how long yeah. it's taken China uh, with all the. Um, I mean, China. There are dis many disadvantages to the Chinese system, but it has some advantages such as yeah. uh, scale, deep pockets, and not having to worry about the view of electors um but um and even then you know uh, their development has taken has, has 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 taken a long time but i think if there is the sort of candid realization of what is of, of what is needed it is possible to do this over years i mean there are yeah. a bunch of technology you kind of forget about that you should forget about i mean you know uh web-based uh you know big data analytics probably the ship has sailed uh if you like you know the us and china are already dominant in um in in that next generation telcos i think europe actually could get its act together because of the mm. some of the uh infrastructure advantages and then you know there are all sorts of other things you know, uh there are all sorts of other areas of emerging technology where europe could you know if it gets its act together in time um be competitive in the long run yeah thanks very much for that uh kieran d d there's a question from kieran fitzgerald uh, security and defense research at the IIEA. To what extent could we potentially see cyber attacks on member states' national grid infrastructure this winter by Russia? And how can member states prepare, prepare for the risk of such cyber attacks? And is there a role the EU can play in helping member states respond and deter against the risk of cyber attacks? So thanks for the question, Kieran. I think it does give me an opportunity to say a little bit more than I did about, you know, what uh, the war has meant for cyber uh, security. So I think um, there are several things to say. One is um, Russia is one of a small number of states that does have the capability to strike things like uh, power grids. Um, there's a temptation to see, you know, uh, cyber risks as being sort of all-consuming and that, you know, uh teenagers in their bedrooms kind of sophisticated code enough to bring down power stations actually it's much harder than that and only a few countries can only a few um uh, actors all of whom are nation states can probably do it russia is um is one of them and indeed it did do it in uh kiev in 2015 and 2016 um but it's not magic. Uh, you don't have a big red button that says, look, press this and it runs a bunch of code and takes out the Dublin, um, you know, a power station outside Dublin or whatever. Um, the two attacks on Kyiv uh, took 18 and 31 months, respectively, from conception to execution. Uh, so these types of sophisticated attacks are comparatively uh, rare. That said, as HSE showed, um, and indeed a similar case in the US, where just a sort of low sophistication hack of um, uh, a net of a uh, company's um, corporate systems took out a pipeline in the US, not because they took out the pipeline, but because the company couldn't organize itself to run the pipeline. So the company closed it down. So there is that potential for disruption. Um, I don't want to spread alarm because when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was an awful lot of fear uh, that things like this would happen in the West um, to a great extent. Uh, none of them have. Uh, why is that? We will probably never know, and it will be studied for years among cyber sort of scholars. But um, I think uh, uh, part of it is that it does seem that, you know, the cyber dimension of Russia's campaign um, uh, it was directed against Ukraine rather than against the West. Some of it was well organized. Some of it was just as badly organized as the rest of uh, Russia's invasion campaign. But what seems to be explicitly absent is any direct provocation of the West. Um, so, um, and I think this vindicates a long held view among some cybersecurity specialists that we tend to think of cyber as a sort of special enclosed dom domain where it has its own rules. That's not really true. Um, put it this way, if, you know, uh, 
the power to this webinar went down and Oxford, where I'm speaking to you from, came under sort of cyber attack of an of an unprecedentedly sophisticated nature and you know, the electricity supply to the city of Oxford was um, uh, was wiped out. We'd probably know reasonably swiftly that it was the Russian state and a response would be required as if it was an accidental um, pouring over the troops of a into the Baltics or another Salisbury horror type uh, attack. You know, you can't do a cyber attack um, most of the time anyway in a completely sort of deniable way that doesn't have uh, consequences. So, you know, I don't, I think we should be vigilant, but I don't want uh, people to sort of panic and think that just because the war is going very badly that these sorts of large scale attacks are, are, are inevitable. But in terms of uh, in 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 terms of preparation, uh, there are two things. One is that actually what the history of the criminal cyber crisis, which led to the events in Ireland last year, led to hospital disruption in France, led to food retail disruption in Sweden, also uh, the pipeline problem in the US. Um, uh, the entry points were reasonably basic, you know. Uh, it may have been a good team on the job, but they didn't have to work very hard. So that's one thing. There's mm -hmm. a lot that organizations can do uh, to you know, plug some basic gaps. But the second thing, particularly for something like energy, is about resilience, you know, um, yeah. and the ability to survive the loss of a network. The example I always use is the next time you get on a plane, just think about the air traffic control system, which is computerized. Um, if you think about it, if I told you that in the event of the wholesale failure of the air traffic control systems, IT system, whether by design, in other words, a hack, or by accident, because computer networks, networks fail by accident all the time. If I told you that in the event of the complete failure of the computer system of an air traffic control system, there was no backup, would you get on the plane? Of course you wouldn't. Right. So should you run an energy, uh, uh, you know, a grid like that? Of course you don't, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about resilience and thinking about the loss of key yeah. networks. In terms of what can the EU do about it, I think one, it's already done. One, it's not in a position to do yet. So what's already done is it's regulated minimum standards. And, you know, that's yeah. now moved from, as I said in the presentation, NIS1, Network Information Systems Directive, to NIS2. So it's, it's better and more sophisticated. I think it's not in a position to do yet and maybe never will be that's part of that choice is are there a set of eu capabilities that could be deployed to help us a sort of member state in distress to a point but not you know it's uh, it's uh, it's certainly not sort of equivalent to what say the us military might be able to deploy to um uh, to the us now maybe that's not where europe ever wants to be so i'm not saying it's an obvious choice it's just one of the questions from the first part of my uh, presentation and it comes to a wider point, which is for minds better than mine with greater knowledge and expertise, you know, to what extent does the EU want to get involved in mutual defence? Because that's basically what it is. It is, yeah. And, and that you did raise that question, you know, about the discrepancies. Yeah. So, you know, in a sense, is it that bringing together in, 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 in the whole EU uh, framework or, you know, can we learn? from greater cybersecurity, the greater cybersecurity capabilities in Estonia or Spain? Is it possible to learn from that? Or do we have to get together and start looking very seriously at an, an overall EU framework? So I think, I mean, certainly there's more potential to do that informal voluntary cooperation and quite a lot of it happens. And there are very you know, capable countries in the European Union in cybersecurity. And actually, I think one of the things is that you know, if you get into, you know, complicated military capabilities and you lo look at cooperation and, you know, everybody in the EU knows this, then, you know, it does lead to, if you take France as the leading military power in the EU, uh, you know, and I, I say this with sympathy towards the French position when other countries ask it for help you know it does lead to some pretty tricky questions of you know capabilities and sovereignty and all that sort of thing that plenty of people in paris care deeply about in terms of cyber defense cyber offense is a different matter you know the ability to hack other people in your national security interest but in terms of cyber defense um it's kind of mostly pretty easy, actually. You know, it doesn't lead to that sort of thing. So that there is scope, um, if you like, to think about um, aggregating capabilities. And again, it's a choice for the union uh, as to, to what extent it wants to get involved in that. And it comes back to a lot of the problems in cybersecurity 
They're nobody's fault. There's no major sort of malevolence or negligent decision in the past. It's just, it's a tricky subject that not a lot of people understand. And so, you know, um, so, so again, it's no coincidence that data has been the great sort of flagship of EU regulatory intervention because, you know, everybody sort of gets the data economy now. It's trade, it's modern commerce. So, of course, the EU regulates it a part of, as part of the single market. But then you take sort of national defences against known threats and people think, well, that's a bit Article 4-ish to me, you know, better stay out of that, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, you know, there's a $200 billion global cybersecurity industry that's actually really open where, you know, proprietary information is relatively rare. I mean, sure, in terms of, you know, techniques and stuff you can do, but in terms of actually understanding threat information, people are sharing it in abundance. Um, and so, you know, I remember when the UK was still in the EU and I was still in government, you know, we did go to you know, the old meeting of um, EU cybersecurity national authorities it wasn't a particularly well-developed network in my day maybe that's changed yeah. i haven't been tracking it but there is definitely more that can be done without actually having to bother people with great institutional reforms new directives you know mm. uh new legislation in the european parliament whatever it is i think there is more it's really dull um but it's that's quite worthy <laughs> it is but uh, it, it it may be dull but it does take a lot of attention when anything goes wrong uh, mm. Kira. And just on that resilience and, and further cooperation and acts, have, what are your thoughts on the EU Cyber Resilience Act, which was prepared earlier this month? So insofar as I understand the detail, you know, it is a good thing. Um, I, I like it in a number of ways. Um, uh, you can always pick holes in anything mm -hmm. uh, written by bureaucrats i speak as uh, a long time <laughs> one um but i think so one of the things um that's better in it than in some previous eu regulation on cyber is a bit more about you know the regulation of outcomes it's very easy in cyberspace to regulate uh, and in sort of corporate governance and cyber to regulate the inputs but it's kind of it's not a waste of time particularly if nobody's doing anything but it only takes you so far um you know, actually preventing things from happening. Um, sorry, not preventing things from happening, but what I mean by that is um, actually saying, this is the outcome that you need to stop from happening. You know, how you get there uh, needs to be more uh, specific. There's more of that in this um, in, in, in this uh, in, 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 in this piece of, um, of, of, of legislation. Again, I suppose, you know, to get a little bit philosophical, it's sort of interesting that, um, you know, the EU is more and more stepping into this with Cyber Resilience Act, with the NIS directives and so forth, because a lot of that historically might have been seen to be, you know, um, uh, member state competence. Um, and so if that's the way the EU is going, then I suppose that's fine if the member states are, are, uh, are, uh, are, are happy. But I think then at some point, and, you know, this is a discussion that needs to be had, the sort of institutional capacity uh, and operational capacity of the union as a whole will need to advance commensurately. Because at the minute, you know, all those organizations that I mentioned that I imagine very few people in the audience for good reason have heard of ANISA, mm -hmm. CTU, since then and so forth. You know, they're smaller than the comparative agencies in France, Germany, probably Sweden and the Netherlands as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but if the... If the way they use going in regulatory terms is meaning that it's more sort of uh, harmonized and unified, then presumably that has to change at some point. Yes, um, but in a, in a sense, though, there there's a movement, you think, towards a kind of a better approach to cybersecurity yeah. within the union. I mean, I think that's what you're saying. You, you see signs of that. I think that's right. And I think also, you know, um, it's no coincidence that DORA, as it's known, the Digital Operation Resilience Act, which is basically about the financial sector. It's no coincidence that, you know, a lot of this is happening at sector level. That's good, by the way, that it's happening at sector level rather than just cyber in a box, because um, at the end of the day, um, what matters is what happens in the uh, in, um, in sectors, you know, what works for cyber regulation and finance doesn't necessarily work in energy. I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily work in telecoms. I mean, finance is payment systems, et cetera, energy, a lot of it's plant and securing those are completely different technology, technical challenges. So the regulation, funnily enough, needs to be different um, uh, 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 as well. And of course, as those markets become more and more integrated within uh, the union, you know, a common regulatory approach uh, can um, 
uh, can, can be very useful. But then, of course, those are the places where the big systemic risks from nations, from hostile nation state activity arise. And that's, of course, where particularly the bigger, uh, more security conscious, uh, more security capable EU member states will tend to have sovereign capabilities that they will rely on more than they rely on EU institutions. That's not an insurmountable challenge. You can pick and mix a bit, but I think it needs to be a more conscious part of the EU debate, which is kind of why I thought that German intervention way back in 2017 was just so refreshing and so interesting. Yeah, yeah and no, it was very refreshing when I read your paper <laughs> because it literally opened the discussion and changed the agenda completely, really, from mm. there on. I just got a question from Donal O'Brullican, who's um, a member of the IIEA, and he's going back to the scaling up question. And he's asking, you know, is, is Airbus an example of the kind of scaling up possible in European technology based businesses? So, I mean, I'll be a bit wary because of one, uh, you know, commenting on one uh, company, but um, sort of, I mean, to give the classic answer, given I used to work in um, Whitehall in the UK government, give the classic Sir Humphrey Appleby answer, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes and no. Uh, so yes, in terms of you know the the conscious effort to um, get capabilities from different countries, put mm. it in a, put it in, in an industry where scale matters, and uh, you be competitive that way in a carefully managed strategic way. So yes, um, knowing that um, I think well, or you know I would qualify it a bit by saying. Um, you know, the, the speed at which scaling up has to happen is probably a lot faster than it has been in, in say, you know, classic sort of aerospace and defense um, uh, 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 technologies, you know, the sort of innovation required um, is, is, so it's probably a, a difference in, 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 in pace, but, it, you know, I would, I would sort of look favorably on it as, as, uh, a, 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 as an example, um, particularly actually outside, you know, I'm not now talking about cybersecurity, I'm actually talking about, you know, you just take some key technologies, you just take some key advanced technologies and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and look at it and, and, and look at it that way, you know, because the focus of this seminar has been the, uh, the EU, um, this webinar has been the EU, you know, I'm not trying to adopt a sort of, you know, classic, you know, UK exceptionalist, you know, everything's right in the UK. I mean, the UK has got a similarly, actually, you know, relative to size to the EU, or probably greater problem in terms of the quality of the research and innovation yeah. in the country, not then being commensurately matched by, you know, economic, scalable economic activity. Yeah. Uh, in country afterwards so mm. you know it's it is a it is a it it's is a key a issue it's an yeah. absolutely key issue yeah. but you mentioned there and unfortunately this is the last question because time has, has has beaten us but you've mentioned a number of times you know new technologies uh, do you have thoughts on the cyber security implications of emerging technologies or is it that we have to really develop those, become a world leader, at, at least in some of these, or a combination of these new technologies? Oh, no, massive. Like quantum, you know, computing, AI, yeah. the metaverse, all of these things that are developing. Right. So this is a brilliant question to finish on. And actually, if I had my uh, prepared presentation over again, I'd work this in. So thank you for that, Joyce. Um, um, so, first of all, I'm really optimistic on this front globally about the chance to fix insecure technology. So I bang on these days about the digital environment that we all live and work in mm -hmm. and how it's full of pollutants. And that's a legacy of when we built the first generation of technology back in the 90s and noughties, didn't think about it and an incentivize security, et cetera, et cetera. So at the moment, we're just playing catch up and mitigation the whole time and there's, there's no choice, that's what we have to do. But as new technologies can come in, mm -hmm. we can learn from that and fix them as they're coming in. You know, why aren't there driverless cars in the streets of Dublin? Because you don't know how to operate them safely enough yet. The, the mm -hmm. technology's there, we've all seen it on TV. Uh, that's a good thing. So there, there's the principle is that you, you know, mm -hmm. you carefully look at the technology uh, partly through regulation, but also through just the science and engineering of it. You think, look, is this safe enough, et cetera, et cetera. So that really, really matters. Um, mm -hmm. And the big opportunity for us now with applied AI and with quantum computing, you know, mm -hmm. quantum computing is terrifying unless you secure it. It's transformative if it's secure and it's terrifying and transformative if it's not secured. Um, 
So quantum is actually a good example where, you know, possibly the limits of just being a regulatory superpower mm. matter because you shouldn't, you know, um, the countries that are ahead in the quantum race are both ahead in quantum computing and quantum engineering, but also quantum security because they know yeah. that this stuff will just not work unless it's uh, it's, it's secure. Mm -hmm. So if then, you know, they use nowhere to be seen in something like quantum or the UK is nowhere mm -hmm. to be seen in quantum, actually, how many people in the US and China are going to care about their regulatory approach? Mm -hmm. um, because you either have it or you don't, and you can have this mm -hmm. or you can have something else. So there's a really interesting aspect there uh, mm -hmm. where um, you know it's in the global and it's in the interest literally of our species to get the security yep. of this right but the people who are actually building it at, uh, will have much or greater will, will have the first call on the way it's secured uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and so on and we need to incentivize that and I'm actually quite hopeful that this is an area where we can really get it right and that could be transformative for both the mm -hmm. for both the, you know our ability to harness new technology but to do it safely yeah well Kieran, our time is up and, and that's a very optimistic note uh, to end on because i think you gave a tour de force in terms of raising the issues and looking and probably as you said you know food for thought around along all those issues they're going to remain but there's optimism about resilience you know us being resilient but also looking to the future with these emerging technologies so thank you very much for that. I think we'd be thinking long after this of the issues you raised and appreciate it very much. And I'd like to thank our audience for their participation and for the, your, your questions. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event and to our team here at the IIEA, Lorca Mullally and Eva Mulcahy on production and Andrew Gilmore is the Deputy Director of Research and Seamus Allen, our Digital Policy Researcher. But our big thanks is to you, Kieran, for your time, for the stimulating and for the passion that you have for the subject and the absolute overview of the key issues. So we look forward to see you again and perhaps we can bring you not, we'll definitely have a big crowd, but come Absolutely. to the IIEA in Georgia Street um, now that we're getting back to near normal. And thank you very much again. And goodbye. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you.